Did you know the fashion industry produces about 10% of annual global carbon emissions? When it comes to sustainability and climate impact, let's make sense of why it takes so long for change to happen. Today we have Cassandra Kane, founder of CMA, an upcycled luxury accessory company and the co-founder of Zero Lab in Florence, the first leather upcycling center and sustainable design hub in Italy. Amazing. Today's episode is going to be next level fascinating, I promise you. But first, welcome to this week's episode of Make Sense, a video podcast that simplifies complex issues at the intersection of people and tech. There are many. Whether you're totally hyped on artificial intelligence and you're ready for the robot takeover, okay, that's your thing, or you want to crawl into a cave after deleting all of your social media accounts, I get it. I'm here with my guests to help make sense of what's going on so you can design yourself into the future. My name is Lindsay Tabus, the lady engineer. I am pragmatic futurist and human first technologist, serial entrepreneur and innovation consultant. If you're new here, subscribe on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. So let's make sense of the fashion industry's challenge to reduce its climate impact and become more sustainable. Cassandra, Welcome. How are you? I'm very excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I love having this conversation and I'm just excited to dive into some of the details and challenges around circularity and sustainability in the fashion industry as it exists today. Awesome. I am really excited because I think with our combined intellectual prowess and power, I can bring the technology side and ask you, like, what does the circular economy need to take off? And we will get to that uh, in the second segment. But let's start with our first segment, Crystal Ball. What does the future hold? This is where I call out interesting predictions other people have made for this year. And my guests tell us their hot take, you know, and it's just an extra level of information that, you know, most of us and my listeners may not know. So I'm going to fire off some predictions. And Cassandra, I want you to say, yes, I want that to happen, or no, I don't, or yes, that is happening, but here's this extra tidbit of information. Okay, so uh, one thing I, I respect so much about your background is that you you know a lot about supply chain. Uh, and there's a lot of talk in the tech world of cool stuff that can be done on e-commerce sites. And I always like to ask, you know, do customers really want that? But I also like to ask you, can manufacturing companies and fashion supply chain actually handle that? This one first is very tech and I want, I, in, uh, I'm not sure how much it affects the supply chain. So. Augmented reality and virtual reality make e-commerce immersive. So one of the top challenges online shoppers face is being able to try on products or fully imagine how they'll like a product will fit in their space. So AR and VR retail experience is can transform that challenge. I don't know if they have yet transformed that challenge, allowing shoppers to visualize or even interact with products online before buying. So as a shopper yourself, have you used any AR or VR tools to shop? I would say that I've used them mostly in the interior space. I think that they're unbelievable when we start talking about furniture design and interior design and imagining spaces in that way and interacting with potential uh, build outs or um, or furniture items. I also think there are really cool applications. I've seen like sunglass companies are starting to use this, which I think makes total sense. I mean, I wear contacts and if I walk into a glasses shop and happen to be wearing my glasses that day, my eyesight is so bad that if I try on the glasses, like I can't see them anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, right. my, my real lens is in. I think anybody that has bad eyesight gets that for yeah. sure. Uh, and even jewelry, bags, I think accessories, it definitely works. I think when we start talking about clothing specifically, there's still so much work to do to 
get all the nuances right in terms of the way fabric drapes and interacts with different body types and things like that. But I do think that it will drastically improve online shopping experiences for a lot of other easier products first. Oh, yes, I have tried glasses before. It's pretty incredible online. Now the question is, do you think this virtual try on will help with the return problem? Because I know that a lot of energy uh, is spent on shipping products and then returning them. And companies like Amazon sometimes just throw the thing out mm -hmm. rather than figure out how to get that product back on their shelves. Yeah, returns are really, really cost inefficient. Um, and I wouldn't say that any brands really fully figured out that ecosystem yet. I do think, like I said, for the products that it really makes sense for, it can help a lot. Uh, so I would be excited to see when brands, it, it has to be implemented more at scale by a lot of brands in order for us to be able to see that impact. And again, I think it's going to be really product specific, but I think it will drastically help with the returns once the tech is as accurate as it can be because people have to really trust that the tech is accurate and i think that's another big hurdle that we're going to have to get people over mm -hmm. there's also a trend you know i think making the online shopping experience more seamless is important and even easier i mean now Amazon totally changed the standard for that. We all expect shipping within one day, two days, three days, things like that. But I, there's still really no substitution for going into the store and trying things on in person. So any way that online shopping can replicate that experience and build that trust that you're going to get when you go into the store and actually try on the product. Uh, this will be interesting to see in makeup as well, because makeup's pretty interesting and in that a lot of times if it's not at Sephora, you have to buy it before you can really make an educated guess about like, or opinion if, if you really yeah. like it. And I've seen now that there's some virtual realities and filters and things like that that makeup companies are trying. Uh, but again, I think it's really going to depend on getting the tech really right in terms of like skin tones and things like that. Yeah. You're, we're going to get there in a second with makeup. So it's important. <laughs> One of the things I love to remind my audience about is that just because a technology exists and some an experience is possible doesn't mean that the masses of consumers will use it. And actually, uh, consumers can only use AR, VR if e-commerce owners integrate AR, VR apps on their shopping sites. And I am wondering, because you have, you know, this independent line CMA and, and representing, I'm going to ask you to speak on behalf of all independent small retail <laughs> shops, like are there, is, is the average kind of e-commerce owner uh, ready to Ad, like Shopify has AR VR try on apps. Like, is that something you think uh, e-commerce owners are going to put on their sites? Like the smaller, the smaller. Yeah. Shop. So I think again, it's really product specific and I think it's also customer specific. So it depends on who your customer base is. I think, you know, personally for my brand and my business, we tend to trend, obviously it's accessories, it's luxury accessories, it's women, but it's also women that are majority Gen X and even boomer generation. They're not as keen to use the AR as maybe millennials are. So that would be something interesting for someone like me to test and see if the investment really makes sense. Maybe it's a way to get a younger customer in, but it also depends on the price point of your product and the style of your product and, and where, where your product sits in the marketplace. So I think it's a good thing for small brands or independent brands to test, but I also think that it has to be cost effective in order to do it. And it has to be pretty easy to implement without having to hire an, a programmer or a web designer or somebody to help you implement it because a lot of independent e-commerce sites are being run by the a very, yeah, very small team and, right. and very, right, very cost effectively. Yeah. So it has to be, it has to be pretty seamless. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So it's gonna, it's gonna take time. It's product specific and it's also 
as many things customer specific. Do your customers really want that? I think with independent brands, the disadvantage if they're you know going direct to customer online is that if people don't have the opportunity to go into the store and feel your product, try your product on, and only customers that are willing to take the leap to buy something they don't know the brand and how it fits them are going to buy it. And so it's hard to, to, to overcome that hurdle when you're an online only brand. Um, okay. So yeah, you want to I, just, to that? <laughs> I also just want to, I just want to go on record saying that like, no matter what, there is still no substitute when we talk, especially about fashion for, the real product and like feeling it and seeing it. I think there's, you know, and there's, there's simple changes before we even talk about the AR, like Nordstrom's implementing video into all of their e-commerce products. And that's not an advanced tech. That's literally just having a model that's moving around on the screen next to, as a part of the carousel of all of the still images. And even for somebody like me who knows fabric and knows product, it's a huge help to see, okay, how is that hitting her? She's walking. How is it moving as she's walking? And I get a much better idea right away of what that product is really like, as opposed to still images that are often highly edited. So I think there's so much room also for to just more people and more brands and more companies to use existing technologies. But again, it has to be like really easy and seamless for the average person to just integrate into one of these uh, web, web platforms. I love that point because a lot of the times, and especially with this next prediction, uh, you know, a lot of times techno technologists are like, we can do all these amazing things, but the actual user adoption curve is way much farther behind. And how can we expect big brands like a Nordstrom's to go full throttle AR VR when they're just figuring out how to do video in a cost effective way? Right. Mm, exactly. So, and that's where some of these predictions are just a lot of hype. Uh, so. Speaking of hype, hyper personalization becomes the norm. Nike by you to customize shoes, L'Oreal's personalized cosmetic formulas. Are customers demanding that brands meet them where they are and to get hyper personal? I think this is actually pretty niche because the dichotomy of choice is real too much. Nobody wants too much choice. I think uh, that's been borne out in economics is that there is such a thing as too much choice. And the average person doesn't want infinite options. The average person is not a designer. They are not a mixologist when it comes to makeup, things like that. They want to be told like what I, I came to Sephora and I just want to know what color I'm supposed to put on my face. That being said, there will always be people who this really resonates with. And I think if a brand can make it really simple and seamless with a great, maybe online, you know, these online quizzes that brands are doing and stuff, to be honest, I'm hesitant about taking an online quiz and then having a brand send me something based on my quiz, but that's a very personal preference. So I just, I don't see this scaling to the masses, number one, because it's almost impossible to scale when we start talking about like huge numbers um, customized products. You, you have to, you can make a customized product, but you have to have a finite options, a finite amount of custom, customizable options, <laughs> kind right. of. Uh, otherwise, I think it, it tends to still be niche, but I think that that's a great selling point. I think it's a way that you can make your product more expensive. It's a way that can, the consumers who really want to differentiate themselves can differentiate themselves. It can still be a really great business. It just depends how big we're talking about scaling. Right. That I, and that's, that's kind of, um, what I was going to ask you is like, what percent of the industry supply chain can handle this type of personalization? And it's like yeah. none, not very many. No. I mean, even on a small scale, like I do production in Italy, which is a very luxury production ecosystem. And you would think that you should be able to walk into almost any factory and say, I'll pay X amount to make, make me one bag and I'll pay 3000 euros, make me one bag. 
uh, custom and the amount of factories who are going to say, no, I don't have time for that. That's not what we do. Like we are a production factory, et cetera, et cetera, is nine out of 10. Yeah. So nine out of 10. I, so yes. Nine, at least 90% of the industry is the not set up to do hyper personalized products. No, I think it's one of those things that if that's going to be your core business, you need to build out that supply chain from the absolute beginning with with some production partners that specialize in customization. Well, the interesting thing about this prediction is that custom Nikes have been around for a pretty long time, actually. They've had a web-based designer for well over a decade. And, and I remember having a friend just after college, I graduated in 2005, who was customizing her, her sneakers. So it's interesting that it's still very niche. So the mm -hmm. thought that some of these online experts are predicting that this is going to become the norm, we're going to give it a big fat false. Yeah. And I mean, I think this was also what everybody thought when 3D printing came on the scene, that we were all just going to be 3D printing our own designs all the time and super customized things, especially shoes and things that can be one material. Shoes are one of the easiest products to do that with. And we're not doing it. And 3D printing has been around for more than a decade at this point. Yeah. Great point. So next one. Sustainability, a growing factor in customers' decision-making process, will push brands to meet green-minded consumers' demands. So just a fact, in 2023, 32% of U.S. shoppers switched brands because of sustainability practices. Yet at the same time, I heard on a podcast yesterday, we, the collective we, are buying 2x as many clothes as we did over a decade ago and using each piece half as much as we used mm -hmm. to. Uh, does the mm -hmm. industry have the technology it needs to drive sustainability? No. No. Not at all. But honestly, I love talking about this because in regards to sustainability, and this can be said about the fashion industry, but it can be said about you know the car industry, it can be said about almost carbon sequestering, almost any industry in regards to sustainability, we all think that tech is going to save us, that this new tech is going to come along and it's going to be the answer to all of our problems. And it's not. It's, it's not. First of all, we can't wait for the tech. And number two, what I like to laugh, what I kind of laugh about when I'm in these rooms and we're all talking about all these quote unquote solutions is that the elephant in the room that nobody wants to say because we're all in business to make money is that we need to make less stuff. Period. End of story. We need to make less stuff. We need to buy less and we need to wear it longer. And whenever anybody asks me about the best things they can do personally as a customer, where should I shop? Where shouldn't I shop? We can get into the details of that, but I'm like, you can shop anywhere, but just invest in higher quality, buy less and wear it longer. Cost per wear is real. And that's the single best thing you can do as a consumer uh, in regards to the fashion industry, uh, if you are looking to be more sustainable or environmentally minded. I love that. I love that point. There is a subreddit on Reddit uh, called Buy It For Life where community mm -hmm. members share products that they've had for very long times, like my Black & Decker Dust Buster that I believe I took from my parents' house in 2004. Mm -hmm. um, it makes some squeaking sounds, but it still works. <laughs> and right, and I'm going works. to use it till, till it really dies, right? Um, so I, I really appreciate that because I also take joy in wearing my clothes until they have holes in them. Maybe some other people think I should stop wearing them when the first hole appears. We can debate about that, but I do take pride in wearing things until they're, until they're absolutely done. And I appreciate what you say is that we all think tech will save us, but it won't. <laughs> so... And We're going to get into this more in the next section. Okay. okay. <laughs> the last one, uh, reporting on material sustainability issues in fashion supply chain will be highly challenging. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. There is such a black hole 
in the visibility, even if you work in the industry, once you get past the, the material production, the fabric mills, as we like to call them, the tanneries, the fabric mills, what you will, when we start talking about the fibers and from farm to fiber and thread creation, there is such a black hole. I've worked in the industry for 15 years. I worked directly with factories um, as clients and even the factories as clients will sometimes not be able to tell me where the mills that they own are necessarily like getting the thre the the fibers and the raw materials from. So I think it's going to be really interesting. There's often a a little bit of a divide between the legislation that comes through and the European Union is a lot further along in demanding um, in demanding the reporting than the United States is, but the United States is following suit. But there's a little bit of a divide between the legislative demands and the practicality of what information we actually have and we can get mm -hmm. with the current system. So right. I think that'll be really, really interesting. It, you know, in 2012, I was working for a company called Gust. We catered to startups and investors. And one of the entrepreneurs I interviewed for user research had a line of chocolate that had a QR code in, on it. And 2012 QR codes, if they were around, they were dismissed uh, for sure. No one wanted to use them. But when you scan the QR code, you could see the entire supply chain back to the cocoa farm. And I remember telling her that that was the product, not the chocolate, right? Mm -hmm. How she's tracking that entire supply chain uh, was is the thing that we need. And now it's 14 years later, and we're still struggling with this problem. Uh, and then, and I agree with you, like the EU is, kind of, is pushing a lot of this, but I know that some of the laws that are coming in to like being implemented this year, uh, becoming active, they're going to affect any retailer that has mm -hmm. large operations in the EU. So American brands are not going to be exempt from some of these no. expectations. No, they're completely, yeah, they're completely affected as well. So if you sell within the EU or if you have any production uh, capacity in, or production operations in the EU, which is most most brands, mm -hmm. most global brands. Yep. Yep. Um, that brings us to our next segment, deep dive. In this segment, we're going to get into the details about a specific topic. And today we're talking about the circular economy. Do you want to, I have like a, the Google definition of circular economy, but do you want to tell us, you know, make sense, tell us what the circular economy is? Well, why don't you go with the Google definition and then I'll elaborate on that. <laughs> Fair enough. An economic system based on the reuse and regeneration of materials or products, especially as a means of continuing production in a sustainable or environmentally friendly way. Yeah, right. so yeah, that's pretty spot on. I mean, the definition of circular i have to look ellen macarthur foundation has a good definition of the circular economy um and i'd have to go on and and remind myself of it because it's been a while since i looked at it but uh, that's pretty much keeping materials in circulation as long as possible using them to their highest possible use and then recovering them and inserting them back into the supply chain when needed. So. It's also it's also about byproducts, right? You know, any byproducts that are not being used in your manufacturing process, whatever waste you're generating, uh, finding a place for that waste too. Is that right? So it? material recovery and re-implementing into the supply chain, yes. And also that goes into using materials for their highest uh, purpose. So for example, with CMA and with Zero Lab, we focus primarily on leather waste because average worldwide in accessories and shoe production, 20 to 40% of leather is discarded. Leather is a natural product, so it has a lot of defects. 
in the luxury sector, we see that go as high as 60%, mostly because of quality control standards and not as much need for a cost saving on the consumption because the markups are much higher. So whether that is working directly with brands at the factory level to, or even at the design level in the design studio to design for less waste, or working on the back end to reimagine new products or new uses for at the factory level for that material excess. I don't even like to call it waste because it's not. Or finally, just recovering the material and making it available to other people who might be able to repurpose it and reutilize it, whether that's our artisan network. We run workshops here with students. We work with a lot of universities and things like that. There's so many options. Um, but it's literally, that's the idea is keeping the material before, and then they're keeping the material in circulation as long as possible in its original form. And then finally, this is perhaps where the tech comes in, introducing tech that can take the smallest amount of that waste that there will always be, because it's very, very hard to be truly, truly zero, zero waste and transforming it into something else that is usable. So for example, now there's technologies with leather that will grind it all down and stamp it into another material that is a leather-like material. Maybe it can be used in interiors or as reinforcements in a lot of the accessories uh, that we that we make here and things like that. So I want to hit on a few things you said because that was awesome explanation. Uh, you said 20 to 40% of leather is discarded. Mm -hmm. And that the luxury brands uh, don't have to care as much about discarding leather because they charge so much for their their products uh, that the the their gross profit covers their the operational expense, including the loss of twenty to forty percent of the leather that they acquired. Is that true? I wouldn't characterize it as they don't care because to be honest, I think the definition of luxury is changing and they care a lot in the industry about making it more circular, making it more regenerative, making it less wasteful, but there's not as much financial incentive to have to use as much of the material. And a lot of times with the higher end product, you have an even more natural material. It's less coated, it's less finished. So there's more defects. So by design, there has to be more waste because you also can't sell a handbag for 3000 euros that has like scratches and stuff on it. Leather is a natural product. It's a byproduct yeah. of the meat industry. Anyway, that's a whole other podcast, but uh, which I've done for others. <laughs> Um, I will say just, you know, the way that I conceptualize this, um, and maybe I will throw it in there for anyone listening um, with us that Cassandra is my cousin. So I have been to, <laughs> I have been to Zero Lab. I've seen the awesome machinery, the engineering side of me really geeked out. Um, but if you follow uh, Cassandra on Instagram, and we'll make sure to have those links in the show notes, you know, she shows these massive pieces of leather. Think, you know, um, poster board for the science fair. And they have one nick in the corner and the brand will discard that entire piece because they want to make the bag out of one piece. So yes, uh, there are um, scratches, but this leather waste is not uh, totally... Uh, garbage, right? It's not totally marbled and messed up, right? No. Yeah. Um, okay. So I was listening to an episode of a podcast I stumbled upon getting ready for our our podcast episode. It's called Crash Course Fashion. The host, Brittany Sierra, did a quick debrief of a, a three-day conference held last summer called Circularity 23. So Brittany Sierra summarized uh, three kind of bullet points, three takeaways from this woman, Lindsay Hermes. She's a global digital director for Avery Dennison. We know that brand uh, because of their labels and packaging products. You want to like, print all your family members' uh, physical address on some sticky labels for wedding invitations. Mm -hmm. Those are usually by Avery Dennison. Anyway, so Hermes listed three ways that technology can enable the circular economy. 
And they were very massive blanket ways. And what I want from you is to bring it into reality for us. Okay? <laughs> Let's do it. So uh, the first is relevant data and host platforms. So we need to have accessible, usable, and relevant data. We need robust digital platforms to host, share, and manage that data. It seems kind of generic. Yeah, I, I guess I would want to know, I agree that we need relevant data um, because it's very hard to quantify a lot of this stuff as it be enters the waste management chain, the waste disposal chain, I would say, it leaves the manufacturing supply chain and enters the waste disposal chain. And part of that challenge is that you're talking about manufacturing of so many different materials in so many different countries, in so many different regions and cities that have different regulations when it comes to waste management, that it's almost impossible to create like blanket policies or blanket solutions. For example, I'll just in Italy, leather waste, it's industrial waste because it's chemically tanned with metal agents. So it's the same classification as car batteries or paint or chemical waste. Whereas like, I don't know, in another country, in another region, that might not be the case. Mm. So what works necessarily in one region might not in another, but I would absolutely agree that we need relevant data. I don't know what she means by platforms because I think that could be very specific. Like it could be if a brand is big enough to have its own platform and keep track of its own material right. inventory and overstock and waste, or if we're talking about huge platforms built on blockchain that track all of it, I, how do you break that down? What is it? Yeah. I, yeah. I, there's a, I guess. it's interesting. It's going to be interesting with the regulations going into uh, action this year because something you had mentioned earlier is the financial incentives, right? And technology might not be there yet for the circular economy because there hasn't been money to convince founders and bigger tech companies to invest in this type of tracking. It, it's pretty kind of bland and generic to say we need data and, and software to host that data. <laughs> you know, like everyone needs that. Needs that. Across um, all industries. Yeah. All yeah. Activities. <laughs> but I, I do want to bring up what you said before, which is these regulations are asking for data that we don't have, that you don't, the industry doesn't even have yet. Uh, so everyone's going to be out of compliance for quite a while trying to catch up. Right. Yeah. If you yeah. weren't a brand that was actively working on this the last five and 10 years, and at this point, the legislation we should clarify for everybody talks about brands making, I think, pro it, with sales globally of over $100 million, I'm pretty sure, or pounds or uh, euros, because we're talking about the European Union. So we're talking about mid to large size brands. We're not talking about smaller independent brands yet. I'm sure it'll be coming, but they really are talking about the brands that are going to have the most impact um, on the supply chain and brands that right. have the money to invest in technologies that might exist or, you know, all of the tracking and all of the uh, manpower that's going to require, you know, this is building out whole new departments of companies just to be able to track and to track and, and quantify and report on all of this stuff. Yeah. I think what I'll shout out is one of the startups that I've been working with over the past year, Acuacy. They say that they are the missing middle. Uh, most companies, they might be able to just track the, the next step upward or downward mm -hmm. on their chain, but not any further. And they are building it out so that, you know, a, a client can invite their vendors, the vendors can invite their vendors, et cetera, to get on this platform and start to get visibility into the total supply chain. Uh, I won't talk about ESGs, the standard, the environmental standard guidelines, but uh, too much, but um, they need to measure those 
uh, for a lot of regulation and they're out of Canada. So. So the other thing that I think is so important to remember, and I think this isn't talked about enough on the tech side at all, is that sure, all of this can work in the luxury industry because it's expensive and most of it is made in, I mean, there's a lot of stuff made in Asia, but there's a lot made in Europe and, and Morocco and Turkey and countries that um, are part of this conversation or have the, you know, uh, are a little, or factories that are more high tech and have the capital to invest in these things. But the vast majority of fashion and especially fast fashion is made by the global South. And it is made by companies and factories and farms and that are not tech savvy. Yeah. And they but don't have the money it, to invest. They don't, but just get the, the, education and investment in bringing these suppliers up to speed on the technology and the reporting and all of this stuff that needs to happen to is enormous it's right. absolutely enormous and the way that the industry is built now is that it is just a forever ladder of contractors and subcontractors and sub subcontractors. So you might be working with a factory in China and they might have a hundred other suppliers throughout Bangladesh and Cambodia and Malaysia and et cetera, et cetera, that they work with that you never touch. Mm -hmm. You don't know who they are necessarily. And brands will sit here and they'll say, no, we do know. And the factory has to be in compliance with um, OTAX and with this and with that. But it's not, it's very far from a perfect system. And, you know, I talk to factories all the time that one of, one of my clients who's a factory, they're a huge manufacturer in China. They're one of the biggest three in China, especially for outerwear and, um, and wool and things like that. And they have factories in Bangladesh. And they were telling me that even just to get the right people trained in oversight, at where these factories are in Bangladesh means that they need to be going into the school systems when these people are children, when they're 15, 16, and identifying who potentially has the talent, bringing them over to China and training mm -hmm. them. So they like, there's a human capital investment that needs to happen in these places an educational aspect and this is where like all of a sudden circularity and and waste management and and, and materials starts turning into starts combining with the sustainable you know when we talk about labor rights mm -hmm. and you know workers mm -hmm. rights and all that kind of stuff and and supporting as we say in sustainability people and planet mm -hmm. because that's a conversation that I don't see happening. But when I talk to my suppliers and I ask where their really difficult pain points are in terms of really being able to tackle some of this stuff that the brands are demanding, they're like, we don't have anybody in that factory in that country that is able to oversee this. Yeah. And, and just we don't have anybody who wants to move there. We don't have anybody. So it has to be somebody who lives there and doesn't want to leave the community. That means we need to bring them over and train them. Like it's, I don't see that being a big part of the conversation. To, to give the listeners some anecdotal um, experience of my own in this, you know, basically what you're saying is that we don't have people trained, educated, but there's also an underlying value system too to 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 track these things. And um, when you're talking about the subcontractor, 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 sub where you don't have visibility and you don't have anyone trained there. You know, I, I traveled in Southeast Asia and I traveled in India over a decade ago. And part of the culture literally on an overnight bus was there was a roll of plastic bags at the front of the bus. People walked up to the driver, put their trash in a bag and the driver popped open the door and threw it out the door. Right. So we're not even talking just like educate. We're talking education system. We're talking values. We're talking, you know, people um, like getting the global like supply chain to care. You know? Yeah, but I think that's dangerous. I do think that's dangerous because I think part of the problem is these like northern or western wealthy countries dictating to the global south what needs to happen. And I think we need to reverse that a lot because right. um, 
I think the like in a lot of these manufacturing communities, they do know what needs to happen, but the money's not there. Got it. And impressively, and nobody's listening to and nobody's listening to them and what they need. And factories keep getting. And I this is the same as factories in Italy at the luxury level. Like factories just keep getting squeezed and squeezed and squeezed and told all these new legislations that they need to follow. And to be honest, the brands even just keep the demands back onto the factory and say, okay, for you to keep working out with us now, you need to follow this new legislation and this new, um, you know, this new certification and this new certification without giving that brand any financial support in terms of being able to get up to, or giving the factory, sorry, giving the factory financial support to be able to get that new certification, get up okay. to speed or make the changes that they need to make or invest in the people, et cetera, et cetera. There are factories out there that are doing really great things. A friend of mine, Jessica Kelly, she founded Threefold, which brings to light factories that do invest in their people and, you know, awesome. um, and um, are really creating an ecosystem that can uplift the communities that they're in. But they're, it's a the small factories just keep getting so. squeezed and squeezed right. and squeezed. We don't want to pay any more for the products. The products keep getting more expensive, but the money is not going to the factories. It's not going to the people in the factories, et cetera, et cetera. I appreciate you pointing out that they, the local economies know what needs to get done. Uh, and again, it's all about financial incentives. Um, so the second thing that this woman called for was physical triggers to track products. So embedding the materials story, origin, composition, and disposal guidelines into the product so that we can track its status in the value chain uh, and also the waste chain. I think that's really cool and interesting. There is a company in Australia that's doing that with cotton where they're imprinting the DNA of the cotton. Interesting. Um, to, and I'm not 100% on exactly where they are with it, but they're imprinting the DNA of the cotton also because cotton is really, difficult it's really material it's really difficult to track the fibers because they tend to come from different farms in all over the world and then they might get mixed at one mill into the same garment so they are imprinting on the dna of the cotton to brand it but that also makes that cotton able to be tracked back to that company and that farm in australia so mm -hmm. i think that that's huge that's super mm -hmm. interesting mm -hmm. we do it we have always done it with exotic skins let's say i mean i think that's a new technology way of doing it we've done it with a uh, bureaucratic legislation with exotic skins even though we're not using them nearly as much as we used to um that that i love mm -hmm. i would like to i think that would be really cool to see across every type of material mm -hmm. yeah back in when i was in grad school 15 years ago i i worked one semester on a, a product concept, uh, you know, uh, brands hand out luxury items to magazines to, for photo mm -hmm. shoots. And there's a lot of moving of product around in New York um, and, and getting that product back. And we wanted to build, put RFIDs into those products so mm -hmm. that they were scanned into, you know, a magazine's inventory room and like scanned out and and the, the luxury brands could track it and there has to be other startups or companies that are taking that concept in a, and not necessarily that application but that concept of tracking it in and out and um, maybe using rfids maybe using something else um some nanotechnology to to track fibers and now i'm going to have to go find those companies well i think the RFIDs are great for inventory management. That's pretty much what they're majority used for right now. I think once you get to the consumer stage of that product's life cycle is where the RFID really just falls off mm -hmm. because jumping that hurdle of, okay, now having the RFID in the garment through multiple washes, et cetera, et cetera. And then in a way that educating the consumer so that they know what to do with it mm -hmm. and scan the information. And then what I see a lot of times is that, and I say this all the time in circularity, like if the brand isn't offering a buyback program, a take back program, et cetera, et cetera, it doesn't matter how well designed that product was if the end customer doesn't know where to bring it back from. Primarily, I focus on material waste that's 
in still in the production supply chain and not post-consumer waste because that's a whole other giant hurdle of now you're talking about used goods and getting consumers to bring them back. But one thing that I do see and I tell customers all the time, I'm like, it's great that they decided to make the workout wear in recycled polyester. But number one, if it's not the same recycled polyester, all, if it's not the same material all throughout the, the product, if it's a mix of different materials, and especially with shoes, you see this where they say it's recyclable, but it's a combination of like cotton laces and rubber and recycled PET or PU and plastic and, and whatever. And it's not easy to take apart. Nobody yet, almost nobody yet has figured out how to make the disassembling of product financially viable. Mm -hmm. nobody right so it reminds me of this really um, recyclable yeah, right exactly you know it reminds me of you know all of the if you ever order you know a meal kit and they're popular in the u.s i, I imagine they're not as popular in italy no. but um it come with all of these freezer bags and there's notes saying that the, the the contents can be safely disposed of in your sink the bag itself is recyclable, but you cannot put it in your recycling bin because your municipality, your city recycling doesn't have the capability to recycle this flexible mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. plastic like you have to take it to a special center. And I will attest that I cleaned out all of these bags last year and I just have a stack of empty bags sitting <laughs> on my front porch for that day when I feel inspired enough to go to the district, the, the garbage place where I can actually recycle these. So, um, yeah, exactly. you're and absolutely how many people are really going to do like, you know, no. yeah, you're going to eventually get yourself to do that. But the majority, the majority of people of people are not, and um, um, recycle it. We're not going to recycle our way out of this problem. Problem, which is why right? And <laughs> we're not going to. I love that. We're not going to recycle our way out of this problem because the other thing I I heard on this podcast was basically, you know, you can be proud that you bought a cashmere sweater. The sweater is is natural fibers, but when that cashmere sweater ends up in the garbage dump. It, there's nothing special or healthy about it anymore, right? It's lo lost all of its all of its value, um, and and just to bring in the same with with food waste, and uh, at least uh, Americans, we waste forty percent of the food that we buy. Um, people think that oh, well, won't it just decompose in the garbage dump? thing is, is that all of these materials and food are squashed together so much that they are not getting oxygen, which means that as they kind of rot together, they're producing methane, methane. which is very much worse for our planet, which is why we want to figure out how to donate clothes and how to compost. And again, we're not going to recycle our way out of this problem, um, but... Uh, we do want to try to keep the natural stuff out of the trash dump. Uh, but you're right. The mass consumer is, isn't caring. And I have to say that there is this conversation that I hear all the time. We can take it back to tech because that's what this podcast is about. Is about, oh, well, there's tech to recycle these materials. Now you can have recycled wool. You can have recycled cashmere, recycled PU, et cetera, except, you know, fishing nets. We've all seen all the marketing. But what is not said is that you cannot infinitely recycle fibers. Every time you recycle a fiber, it weakens and it has to be mixed with virgin fibers. And it is not an infinite cycle. Even in plastic, mm -hmm. it is not an infinite cycle. To go back to one of the points I made earlier, which is just because a technology exists doesn't mean that people are actually using it. It doesn't mean that the masses are using it or that it is going to change. You, it's going to change the world, right? And, and, I, and I do this, I talk about this a lot because people are scared about AI taking their jobs and the robot takeover. And what I want to tell people is that just because there's a hype 
that this technology exists, that we can recycle and we can we can recycle all these things to infinite. Like we can't and it's not actually practical and it's not uh, it doesn't mean that everyone is is actually doing it, even though we hype it up and talk about it. So I want to take you just to the third one so we can tie well in this segment. It's another kind of vague one. Because again, it's applications for stakeholders. So technology that serves everyone in the value chain to track these project products and make it visible to stakeholders across the industry. I feel like this is saying the same thing as the first one, saying that we need data and platforms. Um, mm -hmm. It sounds like a massive undertaking to have technology that we need it to serve recyclers, consumers, manufacturers, designers, you know, brands to track all this data decision making. And is the financial incentive there to build all of this? No, no, that's the issue really is that is that once when we talk about tech and where the financial incentive is in different types of tech, it's not in this. It's not mm -hmm. in sustainability tracking. It's not in waste management tracking. You know, it's in AI. It was in blockchain. Now it's moved to AI. It's in like the new, you know, it's in SaaS systems, I guess. It's in, yeah. you would know better than me where it is, but it's certainly not in, in fashion, except potentially in the luxury industry where, and, and on and some level, you know, there's H&M and these huge brands that are making investments into nascent technology companies that they hope will lead them to these technologies that they can then implement. But exactly like you said, you're talking about technology that serves so many different industries across so many different countries that it almost becomes a utility mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it don't yeah. you know it's it's mm -hmm. it, it needs to almost be like its own type of internet i don't i don't know right. but, um, <laughs> you know i don't see how you know that's where legislation comes in yeah. that's where government funding comes in it's so it's so big and so massive the fashion industry is one of the largest industries i think it's the third largest industry on the planet globally um and yeah i think that's where part of the problem is right uh, I think I heard once or at least a talking head he exclaimed, and it's probably true, there are more software developers working on social media algorithms than there are on saving the planet. Isn't yeah. that wild? Yeah, it's like, um, I, li I listen a lot to Kara Swisher's podcast and she says that tech always reminds her a lot of like really smart people working on really little problems. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. how to get your laundry delivered or like how to do your laundry over an app. <laughs> right. Or like keeping track of the inventory in your refrigerator and stuff like that. Right. And, and that's one of the reasons that I have this podcast and talk about designing ourselves into the futures because we need to start making better choices um, about the technology we use about the technology we build, you know, understanding how the system system works. Personally, I think that a lot of the technology our average worker has is fairly onerous and hard to use. I have a popular video called Why Enterprise Software at Work Sucks, right? Mm -hmm. And if people are slaving away at the computers, for instance, doctors spend four to five hours a day at a computer instead of treating patients. And um, you're slaving away at the computer, it affects your mental health. If you're not happy and creative, you cannot solve the world's greatest problems, right? So we, you're right, Kara Swisher's right. We're solving all these really, really, really small problems, hoping for that day when we might be living an easier, lighter, more creative, happy life. Um, mm -hmm. Meanwhile, these really big problems are, are, are in desperate need of our attention. Yeah, it's so true. The other thing is, honestly, that all this technology that we're talking about needs to be industry wide. And the fashion industry is a very competitive industry. So if Zara develops some proprietary technology that's going to help them track 
their entire product through the supply chain and then post-consumer, are they sharing that with H&M and with ASOS and with, I don't know, all the other fast fashion brands? Is there any, so, there's no sort of governing body that can make them share that information. We live in a capitalist, you know, in a capitalist society. So it, that is part of the issue as well. I see it even in the luxury sector, not necessarily just in tech, but in regards to like sustainability initiatives where different brands will come to us and work with us in different capacities, but they are owned by the same management group, mm -hmm. but they're still going about their sustainability strategy as an individual brand rather than right. the entire luxury group that owns all those brands. And I'm like, mm -hmm. well, shouldn't the entire luxury group be investing into solutions that can benefit all of the brands? But that's not the way it works. Right, right. I want to encourage everyone to think about the whole system. And that sounds like the complaint that you are sharing. So let's make it make sense. Fashion industry, circular economy. I think there are two things that you said that I really love. One, we can't recycle our way out of this problem. And two, we all think tech will save us, but it won't come fast enough. Mm hmm so thank you for listening to Make Sense with me, your host, Lindsay Tabus, and my guest, Cassandra Kane. We hope you enjoyed our take on fashion circular economy and the uh, global challenge for climate impact. Cassandra, where can people find you online? You can find me at we are CMA. That's W-E-A-R-E. You don't have to spell it. We'll put it in the show. Sorry. Don't worry. <laughs> but you can find me on Instagram and on TikTok, both at Zero Lab and at We Are CMA. I am often doing a lot of deep dives if you're interested more in the day to day of circularity, especially in the luxury sector. It's incredible. Um, and in life in Florence and the leather world <laughs> and things like that. So. Her That's content is incredible. Her accessory line of CMA, I have two bags. She has a new line launching in the spring. So make sure that you're following her and checking her out. We want to support brands and people that are going to move this industry forward and design the human experience and the planet into the future. Um, so as always, you can check out all the links and resources in the show notes. Final note, if you want to continue to be the smartest person in the room, make sure you're getting notified when each episode hits on YouTube. YouTube hit that subscribe for next week's episode. And for audio only, follow wherever you get your podcast. Thank you, Cassandra, for joining me. Thank you for having me. This is great.